Friday night racing on Off the Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie. And you're very welcome along to Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. John Duggan here with you to talk about the sport of Kings with great action at Punchestown, Cork and Cheltenham this weekend. Joined by two very special guests this week, our racing guru, uh, Johnny Ward, as always, to here to pick the winners and to give us some great insight into brilliant racing we have this weekend over the jumps. And on the flat, we've got a trainer... Patrick Prendergast. Patrick, how are you? I'm very good, thanks, John. How are you? Not too bad, thanks, Patrick. And when I think about the Prendergast name, um, it's just so synonymous with racing. Uh, you know, you got Kevin, your uncle, um, PJ, your grandfather, who was the first uh, Irishman to be a champion flat trainer in England in the 1960s, your dad, Paddy, and yourself, Patrick. And I suppose you've known nothing different, Patrick. Um no, there's a there's a history there, all right. Uh, horses would have been very hard to avoid, you know. So, what's your kind of first memory of 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 you know when you're growing up and you're involved in horses? You must be just a very small boy at, at that stage. Um, I actually, I actually, my 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 early memories are um, I I grew up I, I grew up in, in in on a stud farm. It was a stud farm built built by by my grandfather called Meadow Court, and uh, I grew up there. So. My early my early life, I, I actually was more interested in the breeding side, the mares and foals, and that, and um, I used to love the foaling and that. So, uh, that's my childhood. Really, was knocking around the stud. And um, even I think with your dad, I remember there's some characters in the yard. A horse called McGilly Cuddy. Um, maybe you might give us a bit of insight into him. I was reading about him. That's right. Yeah, I did mention that to the press one day. There was a handicapper called McGilly Cuddy in the yard, and. Um, you know, as the handicappers, as they get older, they get a bit cuter. So, anything you can do to keep them sweet. And McGillicuddy, you know, he didn't stay the two miles over hurls. So, but if he did, he would have won. He would have been very good because he loved jumping hurls. So sometimes we'd uh, we'd give him a pop on the way to the races. And those days, we'd tack him up. We'd ride him up to the track, and we'd pop a couple of hurls, whip the tack off him, and uh, put the racing gear on him, and uh, and he'd run. And I think we did, I don't know, we did it one day and it worked. He won. So then we had it in our head, we have to do this. But one day, <laughs> one of the good riders, I think, was, wasn't available at the time. So my, I was told to bring him up and jump the first hurl. I think he, I fell out, fell out over his head at the second hurl. Horse ran loose, went up to the track. I think my father had a few quid in him. And I was too cowardly to tell him the horse was after was after covering half the half the car, galloping half the car, but the horse won. That's right. I was telling the press that one day about that story. And um, you got into training then, Patrick, and you're, uh, I think maybe appropriately at the time, a horse called Be Patient, I think was your first winner in Galway, 2002. That's right. Johnny Murta rode my first winner in Galway. Now he's and beating you at the track and you're beating him. Yeah, yeah, yeah and we're, and we're, and we're neighbours. There's yeah. no, no avoiding each other. We're only, only a couple of hundred yards away from each other, but... Uh, it's a uh, you know he he was very good on her that day and it's your your first winner it, it's it's a special day it's, it's a day you'll never forget but I had been an assistant trainer so I had sa saddled a lot of winners but and I saddled a lot of big winners but that little winner in Galway was was a big deal to me and as well Patrick when you're um working with people like Michael Stout and Ed Dunlop and Dermot Welch and Jim Bulger is there a common theme or a common um lesson that you, 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 you could impart to people about working with horses that you learned along the years. Is anything consistent about that? Well, they're all clever men and I think they were all very good delegators and I do believe these men would have been very successful in a lot of different walks of life because they were just good managers, good delegators and obviously they're good trainers but uh, you know the places, the places were just run very well. You know. You're with John claude Rouge as well, were you? I was I was, but I was, I was only there when I was a, a schoolboy. I was, mm. uh, I, I wasn't doing, doing overly well in my French exams in school. So, so you went to a French trainer to learn French. Well, that was the compromise, you yeah. know. Uh, you know, a lot <laughs> in, of the, in all ways of life, in all French <laughs> ways of yeah. life. But that was that was the compromise, you know. Some of some of my classmates were going to the Gale Talk, I think, at the time, and or, or French college, and I didn't want to go to French college, so I went down to Jean Claude Rouge's. That's where I spend my summers and. You know, it just showed when I came back to school, I, 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 gave, I 
the same application I gave to my French studies as I did beforehand, but it just shows you when you immerse yourself in French, or I never had a problem again, you know. But uh, it was a, uh, it was a great, it was great down there. Po was beautiful down there. It's funny there. how it comes back to you as well when you uh, when you learn French and you think, oh, I'm very rusty on it, and then when you turn up something like you turn up at a train station and mm. Allez Sample or Allez Retour comes back, or mm. um, I'm sure you know if, if you wanted to put a, I don't know what the what it's like to have a bet over in France like that with the Paris Mutuel and all that, but I'm sure it'll all come back to you, all the oh, it would. It terminology. Would. Well, I have rough, rough French, yard French, I would call it, and rough French, but uh, as I say, immersion is the key, really. Uh, if I was to go back there, I think if anyone, it wouldn't take you long, you know, you wouldn't starve. You went to Australia as well, so you were... I was never in Australia. You didn't go to Australia, my, no. my, so... I was in America. America, so... I was in you, California. Sorry, that, so that was in, also with a view to sort of maybe learn new things about how they do it in maybe different jurisdictions, yeah, was it? Or? it was. Well, my father trained his first winner in America, and he was an assistant trainer in America to a fellow called Sonny Jens Fitzsimmons, mm. which is a, a Hall of Famer, or very, very famous trainer, and he trained his first winner in, the, in America. So I just wanted to see... Uh, I just wanted to see how things were done out there, and at the time, you know, I was I was just about light enough to get some track work, you know, and uh, but I was more interested in how things worked on the backstretch and the feeding and everything. But I wasn't there. Thing plans didn't go. Uh, it didn't go as as, as I planned because uh, I, I I had a fall off a, off a horse out there, and I broke my pelvis and sm broke a few. So I actually came home. And while I was at home and I was recovering, I was writing letters to trainers in England, you know. What age you then? I was in my early 20s, mm. yeah. Yeah, I was in my early 20s, but I knew, you know, that was the end of, end of riding horses anyway, you know. So I said, so I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to get a trainer to take me on to do something else around the yard. <laughs> and you've experienced the ups and downs of training. Of course, you had an economic downturn. It hit the jumps. It hit the flat. And so you know what you know what it's like to come out the other end and have the success you've had recently. Yeah, I had a, I had a good start. It was maybe a little slow, but I had a good start. I said 2005. I had a very good filly called Waterways, and I think oh, that's maybe. hard to believe. That's that long ago. I know. Yeah, it's 13 years. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at a picture the other day. I uh, I had brown hair, but. Training horses soon sorted that out. Yeah. And, uh, Otherwise, you look fresh anyway, you know, yeah, well, a little you. bit grey. Well, uh, I, I don't feel too fresh. Yeah. I, I was at the Cartier Awards this week, and so I don't feel too fresh. Do you never get a hangover when you're celebrating something, I find. like You can always get through it, because like, you just look back and, well, that was worth it. That's so. adrenaline, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's well, adrenaline. Well, you're talking about the Cartier Awards there, and the reason you were there, um, Patrick, is because of a horse called Skitter Scatter. Yeah. Uh, and this was a horse that won the grade one uh, Moyglare stakes at the Curra, a two-year-old filly. Uh, let's hear about that great day. The three in the Moyglare stud stakes, main addition with Lady Kaya. Coming there on the near side, then comes Zagatova, Angelic Light, Skitter Scatter. Beyond Reason is next with Just Wonderful, racing now towards the final furling and a half. And it's on the near side in the purple and white jacket, Lady Kaya and Robbie Colgan, who come to the front from main addition. And then comes Zagatova, Skitter Scatter is running on over on the far side. they got 150 yards to go. And it's Lady Kaya with Skitter Scatter coming on the far side. And as they run to the finish, Skitter, scatter, it's a champion Sunday to save her for Ronan Whelan and Patrick Prendergast. Does it still give you a buzz, Patrick? It's oh, over your hangover. <laughs> well, no, I didn't say hangover. <laughs> I said tired. <laughs> but, um, oh, it still, still gives me a buzz, I think. Well, you know, I, How many times have you watched it? It's very, Roughly. It's very sad. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is you'd say get a life. <laughs> Most people went on Christmas Day and uh, you've already you know, yeah. used up all of that. So you won't be watching Christmas Day. I did, well, I, I give videos to everyone for Christmas. Uh, skitter, scatter, win in the night layer. <laughs> but um, no, I've watched it a lot, yeah. Tell us about the horse uh, when you got her and, and the background to the horse. Uh, she, she was sent to me by uh, Sonia and Anthony Rogers of Early Stud and... Um, when she arrived in the yard, obviously, you know, she she wasn't overly big and uh, she wasn't overly impressive to look at, but um, she, she had... She was Boy Scout Daddy at the she, very least. She was Boy Scout Daddy. Yeah. He was, as I say, brilliant, brilliant. He's, he, he's no longer alive, but he's a brilliant sire. So he's the sire, he's the father, and the, and the mother is Dane yeah. Street. American Bay sire. And Dane Street be an excellent, uh, excellent uh, line as well, intense focus family and that, so it'd be an excellent. So she had a, as I say, she arrived in and she had a better pedigree than what I would normally get or one of the better pedigrees that, you know, so any trainer, any trainer would have 
gladly rolled out the red carpet for her pedigree. So she won the uh, Group uh, 2 debutante stakes of the Curra. When that happened, uh, Patrick, did you know, mm, I've got something special here? Um, I, at times I thought she'd reached her level, you know, during the year. And uh, the big question was, you know, how would she cope with the step up and trip and um, the silver flash, as I say, that was, we were delighted with that. But the real, the real day that I, I kind of thought was very, very impressed with her was, as you say, the debutante. Uh, she seemed to take uh, the step up and trip with, with real relish, you know, if anything. I was thinking to myself, God, I could run her over a mile the next day. Did you think at, uh, at that time there was talk that Aidan O'Brien's horses were under a cloud? And I think he ran, Hermosa ran in the race, I think. Yeah. He, I think he might have run three in it. And they were all, I think they were probably all like similar Galileo types. But I remember thinking that day, Skitter Scatter just might be a bit flattered because Aidan's horses are under a bit of a cloud. And it turned out that basically I was wrong. But did you think at that stage I might have kind of gotten away with one here because maybe the opposition is slightly below par? Or did you think actually, no, this is just improvement? Oh, well, no, that did go through my head, mm. there's no doubt. And, uh, you know, my new Aidens weren't, and they weren't, they weren't uh, flying on all cylinders. And I'm sure Aiden made no secret of that, but sure, you kind of think at the time, sure, I'll make hay while the sun shines, but she just kept improving. And, and when, when Philly starts improving, there's, there's just no way of ever knowing when it's going to end. And, you know, hopefully she'll keep improving. And we're talking about the 1,000 guineas now? Yeah. Patrick? Yeah, that's, that's, the, the, that's the, logical, the logical step. Uh, there might be a guineas trial on the way. Uh, New market or the Curra? Well, when I say guineas, I think, I think the Curra because it, it's local to me, but ground will be a big factor. Uh, I, I'd be very reluctant to run her on, on, on heavy ground. So, uh, you know, a lot of these decisions will be made closer to the day, but either one would do me. I was down in Goffs there with Owen Sheehan for the Orby sale yeah. and um, there was a horse that went for 3.2 million. Um, have you had, m m like probably for the owners more so than yourself, a big interest now in the Skitter Scatter from the, you know, the, the cool mowers and the shakes and that? Well, there was, there was offers all along, you know, there was offers, uh, there was offers for when she won her maiden in Dundalk, you know. I'll, and I'll never forgive the, her that day because everyone was back in uh, this hot pot that Aidan O'Brien had that couldn't be beaten and he travelled like an absolute dream called Sergei Prokofiev. That's right. He just ran into uh, Skitter Scatter. It was an unbelievably good maiden for them though. It was and the Irish Rover was third. Yeah. And I tell you, I can tell you a story against myself. I remember uh, there was only a small little field and of course we're circling to go in the ring and she's a filly and uh, the two colts are there and they're... They're impressive beasts, you know, you've seen them in the Scat ring. Daddy as well. Yeah, but they're big, impressive horses. They would have made two of her. And I remember just looking at it and saying, oh, God, if I could just sneak my filly back on the trailer, I'd head off home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, no, she was very brave and gutsy that day. But again, we were thinking, you know, Aidan's always improved for a run and did I catch him cold? Uh, but uh, it was her attitude is what I loved that day. She could have been sold at any stage then? Yeah, no, the whole way through, the whole way through. And uh, But thankfully, uh, Sonia and Anthony, you know, they, again, they're always saying, but they always had a real fondness for this filly and a liking for her. And um, as I say, they have a beautiful stud and this filly fits the bill. So uh, if they were to ask, you know, the money they were offered, but if they were to ask an agent to go buy them a skitter scatter, you know. That's what it would cost too, you know, or more so, you know. So uh, they, 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 had, they had kind of the product they were looking for. In terms of um, her physique, how much, of it, how much of an impediment is it with a view to her three-year-old career in your mind, um, or could she prove anomalous in that regard? I, I don't think it has too much of a relevance because it's not as if, you know, it's not as if they're going to be carrying any bigger weights as three or same kind of weights same opposition and whereas uh, you know she's she has grown a little she's over 15 one now she has grown a little and um and uh, her heart is her heart is big enough for for the game you know and you can imagine down the line we'll say if she retires at three or at retires at four being by scat daddy the the clamor to get her and fold to a proper uh, stallion on another line um and the potential there well i think Every horseman uh, would be delighted to, 
train her progeny because uh, if she passes on uh, if she passes on her attitude you know her personality if she passes on that alone they're 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 going to they're going to be desirable you can imagine a little um, mating with galileo what that might produce considering the constitution on both sides exactly yeah. something like that mm. yeah. and you could train it as well yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> so patrick uh, when you've got a horse like this it's so exciting um skitter scatter does that make you be the first person at her stable door every morning and the last person at night are you are you, are you having sleepless nights about her well-being or does it work like that or no i i i don't overly worry because what will be will be and me fretting and, and and stressing and annoying her we we'd often do our best to treat them all the same because as well as that if you start wrapping them in real cotton wool sure they you know that doesn't work either you know they are they are athletes they got to be fit you know she's got to be She's got to be fit, and she's got to, you know, be exercised every day. So, I think if if we got uh, obsessed like that, so it, it wouldn't work. Obviously, she's minded, and uh, but no, no, we don't uh, we don't stress that way at all. And you know, I've got some very good staff, and uh, I've got some very good staff, and I rely on them, and they probably stress a little bit too about her, but. Not overly so, no. What will be, will be that way. I, I remember after, best. after she won the Moigler, I was talking to Dave Keane, um, because Dave and... He's an Irish journalist. Yeah, and Ronan Whelan obviously wrote her, one of the absolute gents of the game, and Dave obviously um, would have represented Ronan as an agent, but I was looking for a bit of an angle for a colour story, and he started telling me that the guy who looked after Skitter Scatter was from Georgia. And I was like, how... How was the fellow from Georgia? In Not the, the USA, the, uh, yeah, the, the former Soviet version. Exactly, yeah. Um, I've been I, there bizarrely. Yeah, so have I. I went <laughs> we over, had went, this discussion, I think, yeah. on, on another show. <laughs> I went over to watch an Ireland game that was called off, yes, actually, right, which yeah, is typical yeah, enough. Yeah. But, it, but I, I had a fondness for Georgia, and um, it certainly didn't appeal to me as a racing country, because uh, for whatever, it's just a racing... Um, I never remember any racing kind of relevance over there, but you have a guy from Georgia yeah. looking after her and absolutely loves her. I do. Pat, uh, Pat uh, looks after. Her. He's from Georgia, and he was a he was a he was a jockey in Georgia. Um, but obviously, you know, there would be no money in it and that. But he's a very intelligent fella. His parents are academics, and I'd say, to the dismay, he 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 was uh, all he wanted to do was ride horses in Georgia. But he uh, he made his way from Georgia. And he ended up in Sir Mark Prescott's, and, uh, and he upped his game and went to you. Well, I don't know about that. But um, he found his way. To, he found his way to to Ireland. Uh, I have some dealings with Sir Mark, and uh, we discussed him and and Willie Butler's assistant, and you know they kind of squared him up to me. So, um, but no, he's very very good, and uh, he has he's been a big big factor in skater scatter. As a, you know, Pat is a head man, and the art, my other head man is a, a Spanish guy, Joe. And uh, they're both very, very good horsemen, and they're they're hard workers. And uh, you know, those those guys uh, they make it. They can make it. They can be the difference between the yard doing well and not. You know. I remember before the Moigler, he was saying how uh, Ronan Whelan was riding a particular horse, good horse. Yes. And he was riding Skitter Scatter Pata, and Ronan was he was was barely looking at the horse under him. He was just constantly looking over to see how Pata was travelling on Skitter Scatter, and then he had a big smile on his face when he saw how well she was going. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a fact. Ronan was riding a, a nice filly, and she's a three-year-old. And Ronan would be uh, lighter than Pata, so um, so that's the weights are wrong, and that mm. you know, and that, that filly, the, so it would, not a bad filly, and Skitter Scatter went particularly well that morning. So the two boys were beaming, but sure, the fellows, uh, the fellows on the other horse shouldn't be beaming, but the <laughs> yeah, two of them yeah. were beaming. Yeah, it was all for the greater good. Yeah, yeah. I remember that morning yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. So the ambition now, um, Patrick, um, is it just to get a small select? coterie of, 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 of good horses, uh, young horses, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and bring them on. Um, I was reading the horse that won by 14 lengths in Tiberi back in May. MM is a 6 of E. MM 6 of E, yeah. yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, can that horse flourish uh, as it gets older? I, I think so. Um, I think so. She was sent to me by, by Italian owners that are based in Fonstown, Natai, Maxim and Wellen. She, she cost them 1,000 euros. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, Again, sure, you wouldn't be overly excited. A thousand euro filly coming into the yard, but they loved her. They loved her, and uh, she was a dragon pulse. And 
I think it was Gary Swift that an Asher Stud introduced me to them and uh, she came in and she won her maiden 14 lengths and she's owned by Phoenix Thoroughbreds now. They purchased her off of Max and Manuela and uh, um, there's nothing wrong with that's her. Samir Abdulaziz, yeah. Hmm? But that's Amir Abdulaziz, yeah. That's from Bahrain, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So they own her now, but she is, uh, she loves, she loves soft ground. And of course, we had a very, very, and the program is difficult. John, will tell you this. The program's very difficult to place a three-year-old sprint struggle against England because the sprinters need match practice. But three-year-old sprinters, they win their maiden. Hard to place them. Mm, not in a hard place. Yeah, it is. And when a race would pop up, the ground was fast. So I didn't get to run her again. And then Sod's Law, back end of the year, when the rain did come, she just, I think she got cast or had some kind of stalls in this injury that no one witnessed, but she just hit her hock, x-rays clean. But uh, So she, she, she missed the season and of course she can't go up to Dundalk because it's, uh, it's a fastest surface too, so we'll have to wait till the March or April for her. But um, time will tell what she is, you know, I don't really know. She's won her maiden 14 lengths and I thought that at the time that must have been a bad maiden, but there's been winners come out of it. So um, remains to be seen, but yeah, I'd be looking forward to a run, and that's for sure. Yeah, I'm getting the sense through this conversation, Patrick and Johnny, that uh, owners, breeders, staff, good relationships are important for you yeah. to to do what you're doing. It, oh, there is, uh, there is, and um, communication is the most important thing, really, because uh, it's you know there's plenty of bad news, you know, there's very plenty of bad news, and sure. We'd all be guilty of that, including myself. No one likes to ring up and, and, and give bad news. It's easy to ring up and say your horse is flying, and I think he, and, and he won, and congratulations, he's just after winning. But uh, there's more bad news something than good news, so uh, it's important not to shirk from that. And of course, likewise, my staff have to bring me bad news. You know, horses have temperatures, our horse didn't eat up, and. They tend to do that when they're entered up. I often think horses seem to have a sixth sense of when they're entered, and that's when things go wrong. Yeah, we mentioned Dave Keane as well. The success you had with Cedars yes. Eleven was quite incredible. Um, another, I suppose, not a particularly fashionable filly, but just really hardy and yeah. had a blinding year. Yeah, I bought her myself at Fairy House, and it was on a whim, and I brought her home. And uh, yeah, when you buy in a whim, then are you like, you kind of doubting yourself? Well, well, you're thinking, yeah. oh God, I'm is this a waste? No, the yeah. first thing you're thinking is this invoice will nearly, for <laughs> this one will nearly beat me home, and then I'll be <laughs> fixing it. And what am I going to do? But. Sean Graney, uh, uh, who's, you know, he's a, an owner in the yard, he's Chris Hayes' his uncle. And he's a very lucky owner with me, and uh, he had Queen Blossom. Mm. Philly, Philly was a good filly, and, and he had a, a King Christophe and a few others like that. And So he's been lucky, and I always say to Sean, his colours are lucky. So Sean took some of her, and uh, Dave Keane took a leg of her. And sure, I'd be... I'd be on to Dave a lot, you know. Uh, obviously, he's he, he's Ronan's uh, he's Ronan's agent, but uh, Dave Dave works hard at it. So I'd often ring and ask him, and ask him how he thinks a race might be might cut up or that, you know. So uh, Dave has been a help to me. Mm. So I, I'm I'm delighted that Cedar's eleven on repaid him in spades because uh, she she was a she's after winning three this year and. That's not easy done with a two year old in every Ireland. Every time I'm in the Caesar Tree restaurant, I think of her. But um, I, think, I think the success you had that Jessica Harrington had this year, that um, Ken Condon had, has been huge for Irish racing because, it's like, as much as Aidan O'Brien is a genius, as much as a gentleman, ditto Willie Mullins. And when Brian Cody is, Kenny will win all around him. We need stories. And we, need an, we needed the underdog stories. to win. You know, and that, this year was particularly special. And it's gotten to the stage now where flat racing is looks a lot more egalitarian than jumps racing for whatever reason because of various factors particularly store horses being bought by the same kind of connections but flat racing has become and you look at the balloting situation now the amount of trainer or owners who have flat runners mm. and want runners in the flat that's right well it's it's actually it's actually gone very it's gone very uh, expensive to compete uh, national hunt not only have they gone very hard to buy um, you know you, you, it takes longer it mm. takes longer to get them tracked, takes longer to find out are they any good or not. So, you know, even though I'm, I'm very fond of the na National Hunt and, and my father had great success National Hunt and, I, you know, I'd never say never, but uh, just commercially, you know, the flat, I just mm. saw, uh, I saw at the time, I just thought it might be easier, easier to make a living. 
Well, let's see if we can make a bit of a living um, over the next couple of days through the National Hunt. Um, but I'm thrilled that you've been in here uh, this afternoon, Patrick, and uh, given us your, your insight and, and what's been a great season uh, with Skitter Scatter and brilliant, uh, brilliant story. Uh, Johnny, let's look ahead to the weekend. What um, a weekend we have. Oh, this is great. Great to um, Craddock's Town, uh, Novice Chase at Punchestown. That's at 10 past one tomorrow. And the Bedfixter Gold Cup tomorrow at Cheltenham at 2.25. In the Craddock's Town, Johnny, six declared, but it seems to be down to four. The favourite cadmium, Voile de Rev, Mind's Eye and Hardline. What do you make of it? Yeah, it's a cracker. Um, I think initially on the, in the betting for this, um, Voile de Rev was, was short price favourite uh, because I, I guess they thought you know Ruby would end up riding. And Ruby's actually riding cadmium now. So Voile de Rev was... Himself and Campiador, if you remember, they fell independently in the Fred Winter um, and an awful lot of Irish would have backed one or the other. And it's one of these, until until this day, nobody knows what would have happened, but he took to chase and really seamlessly at Galway. He was absolutely brilliant. He bolted up. Um, Mind's Eye was second, travelled well. He left him for dead. I thought that was a really good performance. Mind's Eye won since, albeit he was entitled to it. I think Vlad Rev could take a bit of beating here and the fact that Ruby, who's having a difficult November so far, he needs a bit of a, a turn of, um, needs a change of luck. He might have it here, but at the prices I'd be with Vlad Rev. I think he's a very good horse. So in the Betfictor Gold Cup, uh, there's 20 horses. This is, um, I think he used to be called the Mackison or something back in the day at Cheltenham. It's, That's right. it's one of these um, legendary races, two and a half miles at Cheltenham. Kind of the, the Mar- used to be the Martin Pipe benefit. It used to be a really big uh, start of the National Hunt season. Uh, Johnny, and I'm looking at the markers here. I'm seeing Mr. Whitaker for McChannon. The favourite is rather be for Nicky Henderson. Uh, Calandra for Neil Mulholland. So a lot of support for him. And also a good word for King Sox with Tom Scudamore talking of his chances, but it is 20 runners, it is an each-way race. What you uh, make of it? I should mention David Jennings, my um, journalistic colleague, he's having his stag over in Cheltenham. Um, what a what a way to have a stag, a three-day Cheltenham meeting. Um, and he's, he's over there with a load of Gaelic players, I think, so they will, they'll have to be, they'll have to stay the Eider trip to get through that weekend. <laughs> but um, you mentioned David Pipe. With all due respect to, to, to rather to David, he's, the yard probably isn't as feared as much as it was when Martin was in his pomp because he was a completely He's an innovator. He and he also had the owners, David Johnson, Terry Neal as well. Back yeah, in the day. David Johnson, massive loss to the game and gentleman owner. And um, I have fond memories of, of his horses running, um, particularly when Timmy Murphy became his stable jockey. He was a huge fan of Timmy Murphy. But, um, d- you know, I suppose Martin obviously is getting on. I'm not sure what his role is anymore. But David has to obviously go his own role. But King Sox is still very, very interesting. You know, I can't but feel he'd love to win this race. You know, and he, when he ran behind the storyteller at Cheltenham, he was well fancied. He did very little wrong on the day. He just flattened out a bit. But And he, also softer ground than yeah, we'll, we'll encounter this weekend. Which, and like... You remember at Cheltenham, John? It was I've never seen anything like it for Cheltenham. I, sure, it was, it was in the heaviest ground since 1982. Yeah, and it was so bleak going into the festival the day before, the Monday beforehand. It was just it, like it got so much rain. I was afraid that like some horses might be rerouted, but he ran really well in the context. He's had a wind operation. Um, a wind operation and a tongue tie for the first time, so you can kind of draw your own conclusions from that. But he's a horse of a lot of ability. When he ran in France, he ran behind footpad in a particularly interesting bit of form that renders him potentially well in off 10 stone 4. He was disappointing at Aintree, I'll, I'll give him that, but he could be, if David... New season, new season, new season. 11, 12 to 1. Yeah, exactly, and the horses from the yard are in good fettle. Um, so he's he's a hopeful selection in a, in a cracking race. It's going to be a good race. This. Are you a fan of the jumps? Are you to, to watch it more so than is it kind of a, is it almost a bit like a bit like if the flat racing uh, Patrick is business? Is this more fun for you watching well, the jumps? I, I, I love good jump racing. I love good jump racing. I, I I've attended uh, you know Cheltenham a few times and that, but um, I don't I don't study it. You know, be, and that's probably because I, it's not my living. It's McGill Cuddy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't study it, and but I enjoy it. I, I, I but I, I enjoy, I, I enjoy it, especially looking at good horses. Now, a good horse yeah. that is a bit of a beginning to become a little bit of an enigma. We may possibly a Sam Crow running on Sunday in the Morgana Hurdle. Huge race in the Irish racing in the season, the start of the new season. Odds on with ball sports. I think it says six to four on Johnny Ward. The verdict so for you so far on Sam Crow is he a bit lazy, or is it just that he needed the run the last day at Dan Royal, or what is it? I think he needed the run. Um, you know, he was one to two in the betting uh, coming the, t- coming towards the off, which he was not entitled to be unless there was something in in the sense of much he needed the run. I think, in fairness, with Sam Crow, um, it's going to be a long season, so this was a means to an end, as fit as they could get him. Eddie O'Leary said subsequently he didn't think he'd win. Um, 
So if you're to take that as face value, you know, I was at a christening um, last Sunday and um, in, in, in Newbridge, my hometown, and they've restored the church and um, it's a job like that Dermot Bannon will be proud of. They've done, they've done a spectacular job on this church. Where is this going, Johnny? This, so <laughs> I was in there and I'm basically, I'm basically an atheist, right? But I was in the church and I was like, you know, this would nearly restore my faith in kind of going to mass because this is just a staggeringly beautiful building and it, it, there's a lovely sense of harmony there. I would nearly go full throttle if these two do line up, Sam Crow and Faheen. If they do turn up, I'll, I'll pray to God and I'll say, God, thank you, you do exist because this will be a race for the ages. And I feel that, I just feel that they won't. I think the ground will rule one of them out, probably Sam Crow. It's unbelievably warm out there for mid-November. Like, you could literally walk around a T-shirt. How much water are they going to do? You know, as I've said on Twitter, I think they'll put holy water on the track to get this race to happen. From that church. Um, from that church. <laughs> um, but like for racing, you know, P Patrick, this would be just, it'd be great because these are maybe the most two most popular horses in training in Ireland full stop. And to see them run against each other, fighting, getting on in years, I think it'd be special. It would, and, 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 and racing needs, need, needs these household names. You know, it's very, very important, you know. Um, and, and, and jumping can do that more than the flat, you know, because these horses come back campaign after campaign. So, you know, as I said to you before, I love to see good horses, you know, love to see good horses. Uh, good horses get the blood pumping. Absolutely. Super Sunday as well, we can't uh, forget for Jessica Harrington in the field of six, won the uh, Punchestown and the Leperstown Champion Hurdles. But is two miles his best trip possibly? No, it, pro no it probably isn't. But um, as a punter, particularly for these big races, um, it's kind of a philosophy in life itself. If you keep listening to something over and over, you start believing that it's true. So for races like this, you'll, 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 all you'll hear about is Sam Crow and Faheen, and you'll basically stop remembering that there are other horses in the race, like Super Sunday, who's a proper, proper grade one horse, Galileo horse, who um, has a lot of speed for a three-miler and is well entitled to his place there. Now, Faheen was disappointing at times last season, so Super Sunday could well pick up the pieces. And even though he's one of these really versatile horses who, who would have very good form at two miles, but, but stays three miles, um, and he's well worth his place. So even if Sam Crow doesn't turn up, it's still a very good race, and I wouldn't rule him out at all. OK, Johnny, call it. Sam Crow, if he runs, um, if he doesn't, I'd probably back Super Sunday um, at, at the likely prices because Faheen will be very, very short. And if you look at him at Punchestown last year, he was extraordinary over three miles. I'd imagine that's the trip they'll end up going with him this season. Um, but I think Sam Crow will come on a fair bit from the last day. Um, if, he, if he's beaten, he might go over fences. And just before we come to your bet, Johnny, we'll look at Cheltenham on Sunday. Um, the Great Two Slower Chase at 2.25, the Great Hurdle at 3 o'clock, 20 runners to care for that one. Uh, for the Slower Chase, Skull Royal for Alan King, that's a 6-4 favourite, Nicky Henderson's brain power is close to challenger in the market. I suppose, Johnny, we're looking at potential champion chase contenders to this one. Yeah, we are. Um I don't think Anton's going to beat Altior, to be honest, the way he's, he's doing it. Um, you know, if, if he can stay sound, and hopefully he will. Um, I was on a little race and post preview before here, and Tom Malone presenting said, um, I think he gave his bet of the weekend as brain power, um, which is, is quite ironic, really, because if you had brain power, I don't think he'd be back in brain power. Yeah, um, to me, he's a flat track horse. He's just, he's very quirky, and Danny Mullins was beside us, and Danny started laughing, and if David Mullins had been beside us, who regularly rides this horse, I'd like to know what he would have thought, but he's a lot of ability at the same time if he puts it in. Um, but Sor Royale is, I, he's not the, the biggest horse in the world, but um, that didn't stop Skitter Scatter, and it didn't stop him last season. He was, he's a lovely, lovely um, Strong travelling uh, chaser who I, I think will take a bit of beat and I couldn't go near brain power. I'd prefer to back um, something else in the race. Maybe, you know, the, the likes of Forrest Behan, maybe he's had a wind operation as well. And Le Prezien is still a very good horse in his day. He goes well around Cheltenham, but Sor Royale is probably last as well. Absolutely. Of course, last March. Um, seemed a long time ago now, the last race. But um, I, I couldn't go with it. Brain power's had a wind operation. No surprise, he's had his problems. but. So Royale should return in good form. He's only a six-year-old, still plenty of time, and I could see him running very well at Cheltenham behind Altior come March. Uh, the Great Wood Hurdle, uh, Johnny, 20 runners of Verdana Blues, won the last two starts for Nicky Henderson. Does that make him a worthy favourite in your view, or is there anything each way that you might point us in the direction of it? Um, I'd be interested to know Patrick's view on this because she's a six-year-old mare who, under her penalty, is carrying 11 stone 11 uh, in, in a handicap. Um, now, I was talking to Connections of Shattered Love, and they're talking of going down the Dawn Run route and maybe, hopefully, aiming her at the Gold Cup. Um, but Shattered Love is massive, um, so I wouldn't worry about any weight for her. But as a mayor, 11-11 in a handicap mm. of this stature would have worried you. 
Well, I don't know. Uh, physique. Yes. Yeah. And that's what really counts. Um, that's what, of course, attitude counts, but our physique, because some of these mares would be bigger, bigger and stronger than than the than the Colts or Geldings. Mm. As you see, even on the flat, you saw Jesse's. Uh, uh, Jesse's Gore, yes. Yeah. yeah, bigger than bigger than nearly every Colt uh, this year. So, um, sex would be irrelevant. It'd be more to do with their their their, their stature, and their weight. Have you picked um, one out for the race? Yeah, I'm. I'm with. Um, I don't know how many times I mentioned wind operations today alone. Mm. Um, even the last minutes, you're talking about five horses. Nubi Negra comes into that category as well. Um, could you actually explain to the listeners what a wind op will likely do to a horse? Because I think a lot of people in racing, even I don't fully understand it myself, but how likely is it to succeed? Well, you need a vet to answer this question properly, but um, you know. If, you, if, you, if you're going punting, you could do without it, really. And I would say that the, the further the trip or the bigger the test on stamina, like heavy ground, you know, what, where, where I'm getting the sprinters will get away with it a bit more mm. because even, even, even bring it back to human terms, I think uh, I have read that some of these 100-metre sprinters, they, don't, they barely take a breath. Mm. Maybe they take one, you know, take a fill up and they just run and, and it can be the same in the flat. So, uh, you know, but... As I say, the further the horses are running, or the f- uh, or the bigger the test of stamina, uh, the more relevant uh, the more relevant yeah. their the, the wind is. And there's there's different types of wind operations. Some of them are far more severe than others. There's hob days and tie forwards and tie backs and that. And when you see horses tongue tied down, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're really in trouble. It can be some horses can get in the habit of putting their tongue over the bit and makes it very hard to steer or or break. Uh, so that can be a factor too, but um, and sometimes the, the horse would have a wind operation, and the trainer would put a tongue strap on to be sure, to be sure, if you know what I mean. Which we mentioned even earlier with yeah. um, one of the horses, yeah. So, so give, it, give us an each way. Yeah, Nuba Negra, um, Dan Skelton. Four year old, yeah, Dan Skelton obviously would have come from the Paul Nichols yard, and Paul mm. Nichols was a big believer in wind operations, so he's probably mm. just kind of embraced that himself. But um, this horse travels very well. Four year olds have actually a very good record in this race for a handicap. Um, won three of the last five or six. Um, I, this horse was fourth in the Fred Winter, travelled like a dream, and I'd imagine this was sort of the aim since he's a, he's a very, um, very strong traveller. Oh, so Nube Negra for Johnny in the Greatwood Hurdle. We also pretty good confidence behind King Sox in the uh, Bet Victor Gold Cup at Cheltenham tomorrow. I would also agree with that. I think King Sox is a very good each way bet around the 11 or 12 to 1 mark. West Approach is also a horse I noticed in that race uh, on uh, tomorrow at Cheltenham. Um, but the bet this week, uh, Johnny, um, remember Friday Night Racing brought to you with Off the Ball and brought to you as well with Go Racing.ie. Trying to uh, make some money. Our Irish, Wonder um, Lace, 10 to 9 on. Wonder, yeah, everyone keeps giving out when I have a winner because it was a short price. And no, like, not, you know, no, I was just giving this, the facts here. Yeah. It was, no, there was, it was no, more Jar Gilroy than you, actually. No, you know? no, I mean, a winner is a winner. A, a 10 to 9 on, a, on winner is better than a 100 to 1 loser. So, Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm all for the winners. So, three winners in a row, that's good That's good going, folks. You want to be listening very carefully to what Johnny's going to give you this week. This, 100 euro bet with the tote. This horse is by Walk in the Park, um, who was the sire of Duvan and Min and there was massive clamour for this horse uh, it was a stallion based in France uh, son of Mondieu, um, but hasn't actually produced much of note at all since those two in Ireland but at a more modest level um, Tony Martin's horse Clementina um, runs in the 120 at Cork big fan of the jockey Owen O'Connell who's I think dad Eamon O'Connell had a winner yesterday a really underrated trainer great uh, little family from Tipperary um, but Owen's a really really promising rider this is a race for conditionals and I think this horse well handicapped has run well here in the past Tony Martin's horses are coming back into form and um, just on Nubi Negra um, the, the strange thing about this horse um, it was actually bred in Spain um, which is you were mentioning one of your yeah which is a strange you don't see that very often for a jump horse but uh, it's a strange game because before we came on Patrick's asked me how did Jenkins get on at Cheltenham I have no idea why he had an interest in this 7 or 8 year old chaser at Cheltenham but he had him as a yearling so it's, it's just strange the way racing goes but um, it's a small world it's a small family yeah, to mm-hmm. make a long story short um, Clementina is, uh, is the bet for the weekend with the total and the total are guaranteeing um, the price to the SP at Cheltenham and Punchestown this weekend so remember uh, the tote.com 
Uh, that's where you want to be going for, or the Toast social media account to see what dividend Johnny's winner because he's going to get four in a row pays if that comes very in very confident John so, like Clementine well I'm behind you yeah. Clementine in the 120 at Cork on Sunday uh, so thanks to the Toast.com for that bet we're going to try and make some more money for the Irish Inter Jockeys Fund 1485 in the pot we're not even near Leperstown at Christmas yet uh, on Friday Night Racing here with Off The Ball thanks to GoRacing.ie Patrick Loved having your company. Thanks so much for coming in Thank this you. week. Are you going to have a, a lazy winter now? You've done all the work. Skitter Scatters won a, a Group 1. You've had the Cartier Award. Uh, but I suppose, really, it's, it's a 24-7, 365 job, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but we, we, we will have a few days out. Um, I'm going to New Zealand match, to, Ireland match tomorrow. How did you get tickets for that? Hmm? Unbelievable. How did you get tickets for that? You're a horse racing trainer. He's a, he's people a are Cartier, talking. He's a Cartier Award winner. Maybe it was did, the Cartier did, Award winner. Did they give you a nice watch? Or? No, no, people have asked me that. I, I, my, my wife would have been delighted uh, if I got a Cartier watch. Uh, I probably would have been on eBay by now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, the, the, owners, the owners got a, a lovely trophy. Um, but uh, how did I get tickets for the match? Uh, it's an old, an old school pal produced and I, I just said yes <laughs> what, did I, what did I say at the start of the show that it's about relationships in yeah. life it's about relationships <laughs> owners old school pals breeders yeah. um, punters so Patrick Prendergast thank you for so much for coming in thank you. Johnny Ward I've got every confidence in you in these tips King Sox and uh, Nube Negra we never asked you Sam Crow or Faheen uh, Sam Crow um, Faheen two no 10 year old over 2 miles Coming back, no, not, not with Sahin. Great day, punch down over the three miles, but not, uh, not for me this weekend. Uh, that's it for this week's edition of Friday Night Racing. Next week, we're going to look ahead to action at Goran Park, Nav and Haydock and Ascot. So join us then, and thanks for watching and listening today. Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie.